Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have a very special guest today. She is an old friend. We met when we were children in our (laughs) 20s on the set of an MTV show of which I forget the name. (laughs) Snoop Dogg was there. And I have the great good fortune of introducing you today to Suchin Pak. She's a veteran journalist. She's been hosting and reporting the news for almost 30 years. How mm-hmm. old are you? Wait I'm old. How old? I'm 45. I love this about you. Yeah. I thought you were younger, actually. But I have you by five years. Yeah. Su Chin has reported on ABC, NBC, Discovery Networks, Oxygen. Was that what it was? Yes. Ah, and Uh E, the E Network. She's most proud of her work as host and co-producer of the MTV documentary series, My Life Translated, which was featured on The Oprah Show, which tells the story of multicultural teens growing up in America. She currently co-hosts one of the funniest podcasts I've ever heard called (laughs) Add to Cart. And it's a podcast about consumerism and the impact of consumerism on our culture. And that is done for Lemonada Media. I want to just shout out your podcast for a second because I really love it. Add to Cart is a podcast that's co-hosted by yourself and Kulap Bilesak, who Mm -hmm. is fucking hilarious. Yeah. And all about the things we buy and buy into. Products, ideas, books, philosophies, et cetera, that say so much about who we are. Mm -hmm. Um, I have some serious conversations to have, but first, welcome. Thank you. I mean... That's about a, of a complete analysis of my life. It, it's like I'm on one of those game shows where, the, you know, what was yeah, that this old is game? Your life. This is your life. Behind exactly. door number one is a woman you met <laughs> on the set of Trackers, uh, the daily live talk show I hosted for Oxygen when it first launched. Now, oh it's a big difference between Oxygen today and the first launch, which was with Oprah Winfrey. Right. And you came on as a guest because I was exploring this new thing called yoga. (laughs) (laughs) What year was that? Do you know? 2000. Oh, my God. We were exploring not only the new thing called yoga, but we were also exploring Snoop Dogg's Mm -hmm. weed smoking in the green room, which was epic. Epic. And it kind of goes hand, hand in hand if you think about it now. It well, was at a the time, it perfect, <laughs> perfect partnering. <laughs> at the time, I had really never did. done yoga; had only mm-hmm. heard about it. You know, when I moved to New York from a small town in the East Bay, just a country bumpkin. Do you know what I mean? Like yes. wide-eyed, you know. And so, while obviously yoga is not by any stretch of the imagination new uh, in mm-hmm. the year two thousand. Mm. I had never, I had seen it maybe in magazines up until that point, but I had never experienced it. And you put me in my first yoga pose. Oh my God, that's true. Downward dog. I remember, oh my God, if I close my eyes, I'm right there. Mm -hmm. There were bleachers. Yes, there were because there was a live studio audience. It was a very complicated, ambitious show. It It was was an amazing experience, by the way. But and uh, then many, many years later, we hadn't spoken. You know, there's no social media at the time. We hadn't spoken. We, we, I never, we never talked again. I, I never saw you again. And I went to a yoga class. I didn't know who the instructor was. I don't even remember how I got there. I think and, a friend brought you. Mm-hmm, a friend, yes. Yeah. And the instructor um, it sort of adjusted me. And looked at my hands and said, Sujin? 
And I was like, mm -hmm. what? And I looked up and it was you. You yeah. recognized people by their hands. Is body that parts. A, body <laughs> parts. That's, <laughs> is that a strange party trick slash skill that you've oh, ever God. shared? Is that, is that news to everybody as well? Because I was shocked. I'm actually just now sort of assimilating all of this information and realizing <laughs> that indeed, uh, for the almost 20 years that I've been teaching yoga, and most of it in person, I can recognize people's feet and hands yeah. uh, so easily because of how much time I've spent in their presence, you know, monitoring them and, and clocking how they hold things. So interesting. I can't get But you this. and I had only met once. Yep. That's what I'm saying is, is yeah, that yeah. I think, you know, we, you've, you, ex, you've explored it. Your life's work is about so many of these things, but mm. you know, you talk about someone's true calling is, you know, that's, that's to me is the intersection of when you are in the life you are supposed to be is when stuff like that happens, you know, mm. it's like you have whatever it is, the way that your brain functions, the way that you remember things, everything about you, I think in so many ways leads you to be this version of yourself in this moment. And so, you know, to all of us, it's a superpower, but to you, right, that's mm. part of your calling yeah. is, yeah. is that you can do <laughs> things like that. You're so present and aware of things that we, um, you know, we are aware of and that's, everybody has that you know, version of themselves. Yeah. Tell me something. If you were to call out that version of yourself and your sort of superpower in what it is that is your calling, which I think is somewhere in this realm of add to cart because I just yeah. can't stop listening. Um, <laughs> tell me what that might be. Wow. That's such a, such a good question. And um, which is why I, identify and maybe all masters identify as students, um, I suppose, but I definitely identify more of a student of who I am than a master of who I am. So I guess my first instinct would be to say, I am very, very drawn to having conversations with people and helping myself and them synthesize what they say into a broader context or a meaning. And so whether I'm talking about a life experience or whether I'm talking to someone about, you know, do, doing interviews, which is what I love to do the most. Um, but I'll do that. <laughs> I'll be the weirdo at the party talking to one person the entire night on a couch mm -hmm. that I've never met. Yeah. And it's, it's not always a welcome, <laughs> welcome addition to people's parties, because I think, you know, but that's me at a party is I find a stranger that I strike up a conversation with, and then I spend the entire three hours with that person. And I leave having not even sometimes said hello, you know, or goodbye to the host. Um, but yeah, you know, I know a few people like you, and I think that <laughs> <clears throat> that superpower of asking a million questions and really finding out what makes a person tick is, in fact, a really useful gift that you give to the person with whom you're speaking. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, and I get a lot from it, you For know. Sure. So I think that's also what it is, right? I think a lot of times we think about you know, all these existential questions of what do I want to do with my life? What makes me happy? I, I don't know the answers to those, that question, but I know the answer to that question through one simple thing I always ask myself is, does it fill me up or does it drain me? And mm. I don't seek to have experiences that only fill me up, <laughs> you know, like that's also not my endeavor but it's a very, very delicate balance because I think that those quote unquote draining experiences for me, and maybe I'm not using the word correctly, but those experiences often push me into uncomfortable places that I would never go. And that's a learning experience, but I can't do that all day long, back to back. I'm not a seeker of, of those kinds of experiences, those things that really drains me. And so then I need time to sort of fill up with the things that really 
do fill me up. And one-on-one conversations, deep conversations, whether they be with strangers or people I love, fills me up. Wow. I get that. And I feel um, I feel lucky to have that reminder right now, actually. The one-on-ones, I think we're all very yeah. sort of inundated with a lot of inputs and information and people and opportunities. And it's nice to remember that. All right. I want to go to sort of a tough topic, but I think it's important to talk about for my listener, uh, the incident where so many lives were taken by this white boy Mm -hmm. who was by some ridiculous, horrific miracle somehow excused by the Mm -hmm. sheriff of that Mm -hmm. town where he committed the murders of so many Asian women and a couple of Latinas, Mm -hmm. um, I was brought to my knees with an understanding that I had never had before, Mm -hmm. which is the plight of the Asian woman. And I also Mm -hmm. want to make sure that I'm using the word Asian correctly. Is there a better term? Because I want to make sure that I get all of this uh, clear. No, that's correct. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Um, I never quite realized the, there were two words that came to my uh, front of mind, the Mm. fetishization. Mm. Oh my God. Mm. And, and then the sort of demoralization Mm. was another word that came. And then there was like this understanding that suddenly I had been in the presence of people who have said some of the most prejudiced, awful things, especially not just about Asian people, but especially about Asian women, mm-hmm. lumping them all together. It was it was such a, a, an awakening that I was literally speechless for a couple of days and I didn't understand where I could possibly come out standing on the right side of this, having been exposed to so many mis- perceptions and mis misspoken mm. prejudices. I would like to speak to you about the episode that you did with, uh, with cool up mm-hmm. shortly thereafter. It was so moving to me and I listened to it not once, but twice. Um, do you happen to know what number episode that was of add to cart? Not off the top of my head. No. All right. Yeah. It was a, yeah. It, I'll make sure we figure that out. Yeah. It was, uh, off the schedule because it <laughs> of course. obviously it was in the moment, but yeah. It was beautiful because both of you were finally able to say all the things that you hadn't ever said because you were hoping to gain the respect of all audiences for your podcast. It was so beautiful to hear the two of you just fucking go for it and say what you needed to say. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know if you had some sort of uh, words of reckoning for, especially for my white or white passing listener about this time and these Mm -hmm. learnings and what we can take from it. I would would be very interested in hearing what you have to say now these many weeks later. Um, Yeah, uh, the episode is titled Asian hate and gaslighting in Georgia. Um, right. And, uh, yeah, like you said, we recorded that, um, not with no, any scheduling or pre-thought. It really was in that moment of rambling, outpouring of pain and processing. And, and, um, you and I talked uh, about it just really even briefly about how do I process pain and also articulate pain for myself and at times for this community of Asian women and Asian Americans. Um, it's really, I find it to be a, a, the most challenging task because I am both a victim and in pain and um, reprocessing trauma, but as well having to be articulate about it and even quote unquote right about it because everybody wants a right and a wrong version um, of even our emotions. So 
you know, some time has passed. And I think the thing that sits with me in this moment is um, that what's happened in the since this past year, and certainly what just crescendoed in Georgia for myself, and I think for a lot of women in my community, is that it's the first time that we have collectively to the world and to each other, mostly, I think, because I think we are telling these stories for each other more than anybody else, is that we are for the first time articulating so much pain and all of the tiny, tiny cuts on a daily basis that we face and have faced in our interactions as we move through the world for the first time. And what's interesting about that experience of doing it collectively together is, is that you move through it from what I wanted to avoid was this trauma porn for the non-Asian audience where like, look at me, I've yeah. suffered so much, mm -hmm. you know, look at this, you know, um, moving from that to God damn it. Why can't I take up space? And in that space that I take up part of that is the pain is my pain story and you get to have it. And nobody says, you know, well, gee, it's happened to a lot of people. It's not that big of a deal and shamed you for it. So I think that there is this feeling of taking up space as a quote unquote model minority has been for me in my experience, just an ever, you know, fake grin on my face. Thank you for the invitation. It's such an honor just to be invited. If I could just sit here quietly and be good and friendly and funny and quirky and not disrupt what's happening, then I can stay, right? My, my invitation is justified. But should I voice any discomfort, pain, or even blame, then my seat may be revoked, right? Wow. That is my experience of what it has been like to be an Asian American woman and certainly an Asian American woman in media where, you know, when I was starting, it was very few and far between. Mm -hmm. So this vocalizing of pain to each other and to the non-Asian audience has been very much wrapped up for me in not having to justify why I belong here too. Hmm. If that Dude, makes sense. It makes yeah. perfect sense. I can, I, I put myself so easily into your seat and I feel mm -hmm. the, the holding back yeah. that you had to, you've had to do for so long. You had a couple of, um, comments for me when we spoke on the phone recently mm -hmm. about your experience at MTV that was really harrowing. And I don't mm -hmm. know if this is something that you can speak of publicly, but I thought it might be of use to note that whether you speak in specifics or not, um, I want my white listener to know how awful it was for you. Forget about trauma porn for a second. Yeah. It was awful. Yeah. Yeah. It was awful. Yeah. Uh, there were white men who were saying some of the most um, degrading, deleterious mm -hmm. yeah. phrases I've ever heard said about mm -hmm. you, one of the smartest women I've ever known. And I just want to point out to my white listener that it's good for us to be aware of these stereotypes and these horrific mindsets that are held mm. in our spaces mm. and to know also that mindsets as the very foundation of any system mm. is something that's changeable. And if you're listening to the sound of my voice right now and you're interested in changing the way, particularly Asian women, but all Asian people are treated, you will want to tune yourself in just a little more acutely to what does go on 
and start to be a part of the, the body of humans who wish to change that, who are open, who are receiving the magic and beauty and intelligence and charm and wit and life force of the Asian women in your community. Mm. That is my ask. Mm. I pulled that speech that uh, Dorothea gave. Mm. I pulled it out and I saved it. It was uh, given recently at the Mindful Love Walk and Pilgrimage Against Anti-Asian Violence. Mm. Disarming, intimate words. Um, she's calling in love and compassion with every step, and I thought it might be interesting to read it and then just talk about it a little bit. Yeah. I am an indigenous immigrant woman from the Philippines. As such, I always carry with me the sense of forever being a foreigner, the sense of forever not belonging, the sense of forever not having the rights, the entitlements, the access to resources in this land. I am grateful to those who've worked and continue to work on undoing that mindset, on decolonizing that thinking, that mind. For me, and many others, this is a daily reality, undoing, decolonizing, stepping through with the dignity of our lived experience as Asians, as Asian Americans, as Pacific Islanders. Mm. I'm grateful for the communities that lean on one another in this continuous undoing, decolonizing, and stepping through. A quarter of a century ago, I stood here speaking to a crowd of people also demonstrating against anti-Asian violence. The anti-Asian violence we're facing today is nothing new. It's decades old. It's centuries old. From the murder of Vincent Chin to the rounding up of Japanese Americans into concentration camps to the Chinese Exclusion Act. And then there's the U.S.-sponsored violence perpetrated outside of the U.S., racist, patriarchal, and economic violence that has ravished, she meant ravaged, nations, giving rise to populations needing to get out, migrate. This past Thursday, I was at the City Hall station waiting for the Uptown R train. It was 1027 in the morning, and I knew the time because I kept looking at my watch because I was running late. I was standing on the platform a woman was back walking back and forth in front of me, agitated. And then she stopped about 10 feet away and started yelling. Are you scared? Are you scared? She goes to an advertisement billboard and she starts punching it. And then she yells again. Are you scared? You little fucking chink bitch. I wanted to say, oh, no, but I'm Filipino. Please get your racism right. And I did see that's exactly what racism is, what a bias is. It's profound blindness and ignorance. And also that it comes with a profound sense of isolation, a profound sense of disempowerment, a profound sense of alienation. So as we walk in community today, Dorotea said, calling in love and compassion with every step I am with you in turning and facing the socioeconomic conditions, the societal conditions that lead to an alienation, to a, to a hatred so profound that one human being can slash, beat up, and kill another human being. Let's uproot these conditions, these root causes, in solidarity, with compassion, with discernment. May it be so. This really just knocks me out. Um, I've said this before to guests and to friends and to people to whom I personally don't have to apologize, but I am so sorry for all the times that you have had to manage a white person's fucking blindness and ignorance. I'm sorry on behalf of all of us. And I would love to know how, if at all, any of us listening right now could serve this furtherance of awakening, 
of compassion, of understanding. In your estimation, what do you feel is needed now? Well, thank you um, <clears throat> for this. I, you know, I I I want to say before I answer hmm. your question um, that uh, you are the only non Asian person that I have publicly spoken about these issues because I'm still so tender and mm. so raw and vulnerable from all of this, this past year, yeah. you know, um, every day I wake up and I think my parents are going to go on a walk. Oh God. They don't speak English. They barely know how to use their, their, their cell phone. And I think not of somebody hurting my dad who is disabled so much as will somebody help my mom make the call to 911 because she won't know how. Will somebody walking by stand beside her and help her and then will they wait with her until help arrives. I'm not asking you to risk your life or anyone to risk their life to stop some an act of violence from happening. I understand that. I understand that that could be frightening and it's a lot to ask for somebody to put their body in front of someone who's doing physical harm. But I ask that if you're walking by the thought and I think of that woman a Filipino-American woman on her way to church and how the hotel security guards watched her get beaten through a glass door and then shut the door. I don't know what's more traumatizing. Yeah. The beating or the shutting of that door. So it has been really hard to speak about this and I've only really spoken about this within the community because it feels so scary and so unresolved. And I'm fucking angry. Yeah. I'm really angry that people can just watch this. When she was on the train platform, as you, as you had said, hmm. Was there anybody else on that platform? I can guarantee you at 1027 on an uptown train, there were people on that platform. City Hall is where I used to live. And uh, there, there were at least three to five people at that time of yeah. the day, at least. So that's, that's where I go. And, um, I don't, you know, what is needed? I mean, sure, it would be great if myself included, because none of us are taught about other people's history in this country that aren't white. There's an amazing documentary series on Amazon, uh, you know, that I've been watching and learning myself. I don't know the history of my people here. There's that. And then there's this the everyday sort of presence that you as a privileged person, as a person who takes their safety often for granted, can really create a sense of safety for somebody else who is extremely vulnerable. And especially now, all of my, all of my Asian American girlfriends in especially New York, they are no longer taking the train. They're all finding different ways of getting to and from places. I can imagine. You know, this, is, this isn't some esoteric conversation happening um, somewhere. It's happening now to our bodies and to our physical spaces. And that's, I think, is needed. I really appreciate that answer. And I want to just clarify 
for our listener that I think in this moment, if you are feeling moved by what's been said and expressed here, you will commit yourself to standing up for anyone you see being harmed and or harassed. You will create safe spaces for Asian Americans to move about and feel safe. And you'll stay awake for these expressions, these ignorant expressions in the spaces in which you find yourself swimming. And maybe even, if all goes according to my grand plan, <laughs> say to people who express ignorance, disdain, hatred, say to them that this is not something that you will stand for and you're moving on. It's time for us to put our feet down and put our hearts out and say that this is unacceptable and that any prejudice against any Asian, anyone, anywhere is a prejudice against all of us. All of us. I'm so glad we got to talk finally. Yeah. Is there anything else? I, I actually, now that we've sort of unraveled this for yeah. ourselves, <laughs> I actually really want to talk about what gave rise to Add to Cart because mm. it's just such a, it's such a compelling listen mm. and it's Thank not, you. it's not light, but it is. <laughs> it's not serious, but it is. And it, both, it's yeah. so informative. It's so interesting. And it's so honest. Uh, and I would love to talk about that for a few moments, if we may. Yeah, thank you. I mean, everything is all related, right? You, don't, you can't pull one string and then, you know, it's detached from everything else in your life, right? We're all just sort of knitted balls of yarn. And so when I talk about you know, this time in my life and this point in my life when I finally feel empowered and strong and safe enough to be vulnerable, um, you know, it's not a coincidence then that I've decided, you know, to do something like this, a podcast, um, which isn't anything original, but for me, I have always asked the questions. I have never really been very comfortable and still I'm not comfortable. I'm learning to be in um, speaking about myself or um, inviting people into, into my life. And I just felt really creatively inspired by that. And I also felt very empowered by that, you know, that it did take me every second of my 45 years to do it. Um, I think I've always been so scared to open myself up in this way to strangers and, and that sort of thing. So Add to Cart came about, I just thought, you know, it's a really interesting way to, everyone can relate to something they've bought, right? And not only something they you buy, but you can relate to the way that you are as a shopper. So for example, for me, I am a classic scarcity, child of immigrant shopper where every decision is met with trepidation i have mm. carts open all over the internet i hold on to something and i it you know it can sit months in my cart and i never pull the trigger or i revealed recently to people's shock and horror that i pre-return things when i buy things at that moment, I have been known to print out a return label and just start the return process because you never know as soon as I get it, I may not want it. And every purchase feels like a place from <sighs> lack. Whereas Kulop comes from a place of abundance. you know. And for her, when she buys something, I, I'll recommend something, let's say, I don't know, a pencil. 
you know, and she'll go there and be like, oh, did you know that if you pay 200 more dollars, you could get it dipped in gold and then wired with Bluetooth and it'll open your and So she'll go to the max, you know, That's for really her, it's funny. about. Yeah. It's, so it's so funny because, you know, she'll buy things that I recommend. And I'm like, that doesn't look like what I bought. She's like, oh, no, I got it in this custom color. I, you just have to pay, you know, three times the price. <laughs> And I'm thinking, do you know how long it took me to just get the basic model? You know, it took me two months to get there. So I think that that tells a lot. I mean, just even in that short anecdote, it, it you can't help but reveal your true mm -hmm. self with mm -hmm. some of this. And I thought it was, like you said, both a light way to get into some heavy topics about right. things that matter to us and who we are and where we're from and what our parents were like and you know, what holds us back in life. Yeah. What's your favorite, if, if you had a, a, even one or two favorite episodes that my listeners should definitely check out, what would you name if you oh, could, God. and take your time, you can go looking and. No, I'm, I'm looking now. Oh gosh. Okay, good. It's Let hard. I know well, it's hard because I love so many of them. Okay. You're going to, I think you go to the beginning and there is this one episode. Let's see where it is. Um, there's two episodes. The end of last year, Kulop and I recorded an episode just talking about the end of the year, what to keep and what to leave behind. And, you know, I think right now people are feeling, at least in this country, and we are so privileged to be feeling even any sense of hope as we have access to vaccines and things are starting to open up. And, you know, back in at the end of last year, it was really dark for both Kulap and I, and especially her. And uh, it was really tough. And so we talked about just sort of fun things, but it really got into this sort of deep sadness this past year has has brought for a lot of people. So it's, I love that episode because like you said, it has the, both the, the dark and the light, the heavy, you know, and the not so heavy. Um, and I think that that's a really great episode to sort of start with, because like you said, I think I, I really wanted to just do a stupid podcast. <laughs> I told cool up, we met through activism work and I was like, I do not want to talk about Asian American identity. I don't want to talk mm -hmm. about politics. I I do too much of that. I need a balance. I just want to talk about the things that we buy. And sure enough, you know, starting from episode one, that turned into, you know, a huge conversation about me being a person who moves through life from a sense of lack. And that's a very interesting conversation when you're talking about shopping and the things that you buy, you know? So anyway, right. it's, it has been both. And I, and I love that you um, are enjoying it. <laughs> so much so. Uh, episode 14, holding on to youth for dear life. Oh, yes. great. <laughs> great. Um, and, and your, you know, the writing, I'm sure you have something to do with it, but the, the, the summaries of each episode are really funny too. Even the fact of the t-shirts for girls, like, Hello. I love doing that. I wear, actually, I'm guilty uh, of wearing t-shirts for boys. You know, as soon as the kid grows out of the button downs yeah. that he's had all those gap button downs, the pink and orange gingham gap button yeah. down, so the blue cute. one, I wear those, all of them oh, yeah. when I'm painting. Yeah. And You're actually great. when I go out as well. Um, I just want to say thank you mm -hmm. so much for... <laughs> Actually, there's one other episode, 17. Oh, my God. In lieu of more exposure about how the media treats women, hashtag free Brittany Allen versus Pharaoh, and most recently Oprah's interview with Meghan Markle, yeah. uh, Suchin and Kulop confront their previous relationships with tabloids and celebrity news and offer up a new way to move forward. Yeah. Listen to women. Plus, not <laughs> plus great makeup tips from Su Chin <laughs> and all the content Kulap watched before and after her recent egg retrieval. Okay, so yeah. how did we get yeah. from Meghan Markle to Kulap's egg retrieval? 
That's this right. is the magic of add to cart. Yeah. That's why that's why you're here. Yeah. Like you would have come anyway. You're so fucking like just brilliant, beautiful, smart, inspiring to me. But this podcast really just takes the cake. And I want to thank you for it. Oh, my goodness. It's um I feel very aligned when I yeah. do the podcast. Yeah. For sure. Every every part of myself shows up. And I think having built a career and a, and a career I love, by the way, where just a part of me shows up and that's yeah. also fun too, you know, just to be the, the interviewer. Yeah. Um, it's sort of nice to have a place once a week where I sit down with a friend and every part of me shows up and I have no idea who's going to show up, of course. you know, of course. so it's great. Neither one of us ever, by the way, um, with the podcast if you've never listened to it, we don't know what we're bringing to the podcast. Mm. Every time we record, it's a surprise. I have no idea what Kulop's going to talk about and vice versa. So, wow. I think that adds to the element of delight, shock, and, you know, complete mortification. Yeah. You know, that actually is very, I didn't know that. That's really yeah. fun to know. Um, I'd also like to point out in closing to our listener that Something like this, where they just went ahead and created this thing. I mean, obviously, Suchin has a history in media, but she went ahead, followed her heart, created something that is at, at once hilarious and so profound from her heart and and didn't really, you know, didn't doesn't have to answer to too many voices. Yes. You know what I mean? And just right. does yeah, what she yeah. wishes. That's an inspiring aspect of this for all of us yeah follow your follow the energy follow mm -hmm. your heart follow mm -hmm. your your calling as it were and i don't mean that sort of poetically i mean it very practically yeah. um and wait to see what happens because there are so many nuances and facets we we haven't seen of you our listener just yet mm -hmm. if you do that we'll see a little bit more of you and that'll be a very interesting contribution that you can make to the world very well said. Yeah. I, I, I think that that's mm -hmm. absolutely true. It's great. Isn't that freeing? Just so freeing totally. to think of it that way. Just yeah. let go of all the other, who's going to listen, who's going to watch, and how is it going to be? None of that. Just do it. Just do it to your heart's desire. It's very liberating. Yeah. Thank you for that. And more soon, I am at your disposal for anything that you might need. Uh, if you ever want me on your podcast, I would pretty much die to be on. <laughs> and I'm at your service anytime. I mean, talking, you know, you spend so much of your day talking about such beautiful, <sighs> spiritual, profound things to know what's on your credit card statement. Are you kidding? Oh, my God. All, our, totally. all, your, all your listeners, all the, the, the Elena community is like, Wait. you would laugh your ass off. Yeah, I think I'm in. Would, I, I mean, you let me know when. Okay. You let me we'll know. We'll do. When. I love you, girl. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank so you good to here. hear your voice and connect again. Yeah, you too. Yeah. You too. <laughs>